Gosh, it's lovely to be here, and it's cooler, isn't it? So much cooler. Is that why you've come? No. <laughs> anyway, it's, I mean, I can feel the buzz. I see so many more women here. <laughs> Where are the men? But we've taken over the floor, haven't we? <laughs> All right, so it is such a privilege to be here with these fantastic women who've won so many prizes, written, rocked the boat, and basically, yeah, done everything to set, set the place on fire. So let's, let's dive in straight away. Um, this is the fantastic um, book I'm going to hold up, Letters to a Writer of Color, which has been edited by Deepa and Temur Sumru. Both of them have done this together. And it is, I would say, like compulsory reading for not just writers of color, but also uh, authors, agents, uh, no, uh, not authors, uh, publishers, agents, and critics as well. Because, uh, you know, as you'll see in the chapters that Deepa and her co-editor have done, they've actually outlined all the issues that people of color face. And I think you've done it brilliantly. So tell us a little bit about what went into this book. Oh, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Is that okay? Yeah. So, um, Temur and I were students of a creative writing program, and that's how we met. And, um, you know, we found that the Western classrooms were not at all diverse. Our reading lists were not diverse. Um, the examples that we were given, they tend to be, say, from, tended to be from Greek mythology. And there was not much awareness about storytelling traditions from around the world. Mm -hmm. And we faced particular challenges as we were writing, and we didn't find answers in the classroom or in the textbooks or, you know, in, the, in reviews or in media. So these questions didn't come up often, which was about... Uh, translating our culture, translating our language, you, you know, our characters are speaking in a language which is not English. And how do you translate that? Do, are you meant to translate culture? And if you do that, you know, how do you keep to a maxim like show, don't tell? Because mm -hmm. translating often involves some explanations. So with, we were grappling for answers for those questions. We didn't find answers. And then we thought of putting this book together to ask experienced writers to come up with suggestions to talk about how they negotiated those questions. Mm -hmm. The publishing industry is, you know, still very wide. Mm -hmm. And we are being read by editors. Our work is being evaluated by those who don't have any experience of our culture. And that often means that a lot of our nuances, you know, they get lost. So uh, they can't pick up on um, some of you know, the complexities of the social situation, for instance, that we are trying to present. Sure. And so, you know, approaching, these are all writers we admire greatly, whose books, I think, tackle some of these subjects. And we approach them, asking them, you know, how did you deal with this particular question? What was mm -hmm. your experience like? Mm -hmm. So the resulting book is not, uh, you know, it is not prescriptive. It's not like a creative writing textbook. Every mm -hmm. essay is very personal. It's mm -hmm. about, so... The titles are structure on structure, on character, on humor, but mm -hmm. the, each writer is really talking about their experience of writing a novel and what were the challenges that they faced and how did they negotiate you know, those mm -hmm. questions. So did you give the titles to the authors or did the authors choose them themselves? Um, I think mm -hmm. we did make suggestions. Like We did want it to follow the outline of a creative writing mm -hmm. guidebook, mm -hmm. but beyond saying, you know, can you write something about structure because you have approached structure sure. in this really interesting way in your novel or, you know, with Shalu, I think, mm -hmm. I said, you know, you've written so much about the question of translation. Mm -hmm. Do you think you can write about that? So it was a um, with Talmima, I think she wanted, she suggested humor. She said, I would much rather write about that because it's something mm -hmm. I'm thinking about. Yeah. Um, so sometimes that happened as well. You know, the writers right. came back with uh, some, we suggested something and it they was, came was sort of discussion. Sure, yeah. sure. Lovely. And, um, you know, you trained as a journalist in India. You worked as a journalist. Um, so it was obviously facts that you were reporting all the time. And uh, when you came here, you wanted to do a creative writing course. Um, a lot of the authors in this have actually said that, you know, what you said just now, that they were compartmentalized in these creative writing courses. Um, so did you feel that? I mean, what was, what was your experience? I think so. I think that, you know, it's a difficult question because it's, we've titled the book Letters to a Writer of Color. Sure. And in sure. a way, it seems like we are kind of putting ourselves in one corner. Mm -hmm. And we did debate this question, is this the right title for this book? Mm -hmm. But we wanted to reach certain readers who I've, you know, we felt were not being represented. 
uh, both in publishing and in, uh, in the media in academia. And the best way for us to do that was to use you know, that particular word. But Leila says in her interview, what, is, you know, what does it course. mean by a writer of color? We yeah, are all quite absolutely. different. So we do address that in the introduction. But the ways in which, you know, uh, some <coughs> of the ways in which I felt it was reductive was that you know, books are read like anthropology. We are very, you know, it's very rarely that we are asked questions about our craft. We are often asked to talk about our country mm -hmm. or about, you know, with my first novel, I was asked to talk about poverty in India. And, you know, I don't want to, I also want to talk about sure. um, character and structure, and that doesn't happen. Right, yeah. right. So you want to read a little extract from, um, it's not from your book, but it's from the, from the essays? Yeah, sure. <coughs> This is uh, Deepa's contribution in this book. I mean, apart from the editing. Yeah. Um, so I've written an essay, which is the last one in the book, really. And it is about, you know, with, with this book, we wanted it to not only address issues of craft, but also talk about the writing life, because it's kind of inseparable. You can't really move, you know, uh, how you are as a writer, how you find time to write. I think these are big questions for writers of color. So we wanted to address that. I just want to say that, you know, um, as a content note, I want to say that it's a difficult subject because it's about the challenges that I faced while I was writing my first novel. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that it may, might be difficult for a few people to listen to that. Um, so I just want to put that it's out. It's deeply personal, but you have put it down. So we'll, you know, thank you for sharing it with us. Yeah. Yeah. So it's titled On the Ideal <clears throat> Conditions for Writing. One, my sister is dying of cancer and I'm writing a novel. I can rearrange these words, alter the tense or syntax, but it won't make the sentence any less disagreeable or coarse. I can't accept, much less articulate, this reality. Outside the hospital where my sister is receiving treatment, I walk on roads that lack pavements, the wheels of bikes and cars rasping at my feet. Grief is the unsightly red patch thickening my right eyelid, the persistent nausea that exaggerates the feeling that beneath my skin, I'm entirely hollow. On my shoulders are the red marks imprinted by the straps of a backpack that holds chargers, adapters, a laptop, medicines, books, an e-reader, and a journal divided into two unequal halves. Scribbled on the journal's first few pages are notes about my novel, written before my sister's diagnosis. Whatever the condition of writing I imagined when I underlined scenes and myth, it was not this. Now, time ripples, buckles, dissolves, surges past the margins as I attempt to pin it down with to-do lists. Talk to doctor about pet results, scan documents, send biopsy report to M, speak to V about insurance, call Vic Guy. After I have put a tick mark against some of these stars, I sit on a flimsy plastic chair in the hospital room, several browser tabs and a Word document that I call my novel open on my laptop. Voices and feet shuffle outside the half-open door. Machines beep, a refrain that suits until a fluctuation is detected and catawals ensue. Then, nurses call for doctors, chests crackle with sobs, twisted mouths amplify shouts. I avert my eyes from the redness darkening an ochre blanket on a gurney rushed down the corridor and glance at my sister. This is not it, our fate. I cling to my novel, a place of my own making. Its main protagonist is a cheerful nine-year-old boy. Confronted with the disappearances of his friends, he spins a story to persuade himself he's invincible. Still, he remains only a hair's breadth from vanishing. All things in his world are impermanent. From his narrative, I hope to extract a truth about life that may well be about death. Or perhaps what I wish to locate in his story is the possibility that as the earth cleaves under our feet, we may not always implode. Thank you. Thank you. That was really moving. Um, Leila, you were born in Sudan, and as we were discussing earlier, uh, you came here in your early 20s, much like I did, actually. And um, the interesting thing you said, you say in your essay, is that when um, in Sudan you were a modern, more westernized woman, when you came here, you, want, you opted to wear the hijab. Um, in Sudan, you've identified yourself as Arab, and when you came here, you identified yourself as black. So how, you know, just tell us how these 
um, identities evolve over time and what it was like for you? Um, I think seeing you know myself and seeing how things have changed since I first got published and all these years since the 80s there always seems to be a change of, of the naming you know there was a time when we were all uh, you know uh, black and Asian and there was no such thing as Muslim mm -hmm. And there was a time then when we, be, we were uh, ethnic minorities and then there was a time when we were immigrants and then there were a time when we were international writers and you could go into a bookshop and find a table which says international writers on it. And so all, the, all these namings seems to be labels that are being put on us. Whereas we ourselves, you know, we... we uh, uh, you know, we, we are living our life with our day-to-day -day life is is um, maybe hasn't hasn't changed, uh, but but it's just the way that we are called, we are named, and I think that now, um, uh, as Deepa mentioned, this thing about being a writer of color, this is how it is now. After I, I don't guarantee, I can't guarantee that after ten years, you know, we will still be writers of colors. Or after twenty years, I don't know what what we will be called then. So it's it's it it kind of changes around, and I'm not I'm uncomfortable. With who is it exactly who is deciding on this? You know, BAME was a, a word that was very uh, well received. Uh, then suddenly people went against it, and. And you're always trying to find what is the correct word mm -hmm. <laughs> to, 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 to identify your, yourself, yeah. It is a feeling that you have to be slotted. And um, I don't know how you feel about, I mean, all of you, uh, you know, you probably just hate that, don't you? I mean, just having to fit into some slot at some time. But uh, we'll come to, we'll come to um, Temi Mahanyo Shialu in a bit. Um, this essay, uh, is uh, your title is Violence, which of course is not easy to write. Uh, but, you know, what is incredible, and I read your River Island, I just read it nonstop over the weekend, it was so beautiful. Um, I, your language is, is just so gentle, and yet you are describing these extremely violent scenes. So, you know, there's so many budding writers here. Tell us a little bit about the craft of writing and um, what it's like to write. I mean, we come from countries with very violent pasts and, uh, you know, what it's like. Yeah, I think with, with, with the essay, which is, um, it wasn't an essay actually, it's, an, it's a conversation between me and, and Nadifa uh, mm -hmm. Muhammad, who wrote uh, The Fortune uh, Men. Um, and uh, we were, you know, we were talking about this concept of violence and whether uh, there could be a cultural relativity to do with violence. And whether for we didn't really talk about children, you know, parental, you know, punishment of children or smacking or something like that. But these kind of things, they they they're different between cultures and between time. And whether as writers, when we are writing, uh, should we be honest and 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 write about this kind of violence that is perhaps in our in our communities or in our countries and and how people see it or whether we have to take into account you know what what the standard is now you know and how people feel about such things now um, so that was what, what, what was one of the things that we um, we uh, uh, talked about um, but but uh, and at the same time we there is also of course behind all this anxiety that we don't want to uh, pander to the stereotype we don't want to be like Oh, uh, you know, people have this idea that that you know Muslim men are violent. So now I have to be, you know, I shouldn't really shouldn't should I really write this or not? And and then people will think this or you know. So all this anxiety, I, I think this is very bad for writing <laughs> because you really shouldn't be writing uh, and looking over your shoulder all the time. You should have this freedom to write. The, the, the truth that you see and not worry either way, you know, mm -hmm. be, be so keen to, uh, you know, mustn't, I mustn't uh, shock mm -hmm. people too much or I mustn't, you know, the comfort, it's of a course. kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Do, you want, do you want to read a little extract? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is just the, the <coughs> prologue of, of my novel. Uh, it starts the, New, the Nuba Mountains in Sudan, December 1881. Rabha steps out of her hut, sets out to warn the Mahdi. The night is lit by a full yellow moon. She must not be seen by the soldiers surrounding the village. The governor of Fashoda is on the move, intent on annihilating the Mahdi once and for all. She must get to him first. Sounds of a shuffle, a pant. She turns to see the old hunting dog following her. She bends down, rummages on the ground, finds a mango stone and throws it at the dog. 
she picks up a chewed bit of sugar cane. It is still in her hand when she reaches the outskirts of the village. The vegetation thickens and rising out of the shadows is a Shilok warrior, spear in hand, muscular torso above his loincloth, the physique of a wrestler. She reaches for her knife. She turns so that he can see her in full, curves, breasts, glow of shoulder, long braids. She forces her body into limpness, hides her hand behind her back, palm tight over the knife. He approaches, first with caution, then the start of a swagger, makes low, soothing sounds, as if she were a skittish calf, lone antelope, stray prey. He must be near enough now to, smell, to scent the sandalwood she uses in her hair to drench the smell of grease. She can see the decorative row of bead-like scarring across his forehead. He drops his spear. She waits a beat and aims down at his stomach. Thank you. <clears throat> so on, on the subject of violence, uh, I'm coming to you there, Mima, now, uh, because you wrote uh, this fabulous trilogy uh, on the War of Independence in Bangladesh and then the sequels and how it, you know, how it changed. Um, and then after all these very serious historic political books, you wanted to write a rom-com. <laughs> And it wasn't easy because you had to you know, convince your publisher, you had to convince your agent. You almost took a pseudonym, thought you'd write under a pseudonym. I mean, why was it so difficult to just break out and do something you wanted to do? Um, thank you, Shaboni, and thank you to JLF for having us. I always love coming to this festival. Um, so the essay that I wrote in Deepa's anthology is about the kind of novels that people like me are expected to write and what that means for me as an individual writer. Um, and, but, and also, if we decide to not write those novels, what is the cost, um, that, the price that we have to pay? Um, and I, I have been thinking about this a lot because, and if you'll forgive me, um, uh, my father is in the audience today. And uh, I was gonna come here and tell you about how hard it was for me to write comedy, but in fact, uh, my father is being sued by the mayor of Dhaka because he published a piece of satire in his newspaper. And that is the cost of comedy. I really did not pay a price. <laughs> um, maybe people took me a little bit less seriously. And, and really that's uh, a reflection both on, you know, it, it's, not that I, it, it's not that I'm belittling what I did. It's just that it's important for us to bear in mind that we live in an extremely privileged context. And the ability to speak is something that we take for granted. Um, so I just want to shout out to my father and, and, and salute him because really he's, he's really... Uh, um, um, the brave one here. Um, so I wrote three novels that, I, that were deeply important to me and that I had very serious stakes in writing. Uh, it's a trilogy telling the story of Bangladesh through the eyes of three generations of women in one family. Um, but those were also the novels that people expected me to write. And in a way, I was being very obedient when I wrote them. And I was also being very obedient when I did my kind of diplomatic duty in whenever I went on stage in sort of talking about how Bangladesh has been cast in a particular light mm -hmm. and challenging those stereotypes. And it's very important to me that I have the privilege of having this platform and I can do that. And I, I don't take that for granted. I don't think, okay, you're putting me in a box, why are you making me talk about Bangladesh? Although it's not all that I am, mm -hmm. but at least I get to do that. And I think that is an important thing to bear in mind. Um, much as I don't want to be cast as an ambassador, <laughs> I did take my ambassadorial duties very seriously. And then I thought, okay, well, I want to write a novel about sexism in the workplace. Because a, a few years ago, I got my first real job. I had never had a real job, and I went into an office every day, and I realized the office is very unreformed. It's an extremely sexist place. It is not the place that we imagine that it is when we watch um, television or we kind of, the way that I had imagined it. I thought all of the conversations we were having about equality had filtered into the workplace, but in fact, they have not. And the one thing that is deeply unreformed in the workplace is the sexist joke. 
People tell really sexist jokes in the workplace, and it's very difficult to sit in an audience, to sit in a room where somebody's telling a joke and not to laugh. And that's how we participate in the, the sort of recreation of these stereotypes, because it's so awkward to be the one to say, actually, that's not really that's funny, not that's really sexist. <laughs> no one wants to be that person. Um, so I wrote a novel called The Startup Wife about sexism in the workplace. And all the things that I could not say in the workplace, I said in this book. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and I was like taking notes whenever someone said something, and I was like, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> so this is like 200 pages of revenge right here. Oh. That's what this is. And of course, you went far away from Bangladesh. You went to New York. And uh, well, you, you just wrote about startups and the most bizarre startups. And we're going to hear a little bit about them. I know Baba is in the audience and filming, but <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to read the most salacious parts of this book. <laughs> Uh, I read like the PG-13, <laughs> not the really R-rated stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, they were like, they were hilarious, you know, sort of, um, well, you say them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, go on. Um, uh, yeah, I'll just read from here. Um, the silent vibrator. Let me just no, give I'm you. No, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. You can, you, can, you can read the book if you want to get the really juicy stuff. Um, so this is a scene that takes place in the bathroom of an office. And as we know, lots of interesting things happen in the women's room. Um, I close the stall and cry hard. I'm so busy cracking myself up, I don't notice there's a person in the stall next to mine. She's got some kind of machine in there with her, something that wheezes and sighs. Are you okay? I ask. Are you? She replies between wheezes. I'm fine. I was just crying on account of my own awesomeness. Is that a nebulizer? Do you have asthma? <laughs> no, I'm pumping. She comes out of her stall and I come out of mine. She looks like a half human, half cyborg, with her dress pulled down around her waist and two cups attached to her breasts. The cups are each half full of milk. My kid is two years old, but she refuses to drink any other kind of milk. I nod, fascinated by the engineering of her bra, which appears to be holding the entire contraption upright. We've tried cow, goat, almond, oat, soy, and hemp, everything except rice. You're not allowed to give them rice. Because of the arsenic? Do you have kids? No, I'm just a nerd. <laughs> I used to be a nerd, she says. Now I'm producing the milk of human guilt. <laughs> Is there nowhere else in this fancy office where you can do it? It's all open plan, she says. It's more democratic that way. I'm Asha Ray, I say. Amanda Wakefield, she replies. So what were you crying about? I built this thing and I was suddenly realizing how amazing it is and it made me cry, I said. That's great, I'm really happy for you. She looks like she's about to impart some wisdom, but instead she throws her hands up I better go. My cups runneth over. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Oh, and now I go to Jalu. Um, Jalu, you lived as a child in a fishing village in China and then moved to the town of Wenling, a mountainous province. Um, you, learned, you spoke English quite late in life, but now you write in English. Uh, and in this book, you write about translation, and um, you really describe it well. You talk about self-translation, uh, and um, you describe it as crossing a wild river from one bank to another. So tell us, I mean, what, what is self-translation, and what made you self-translate in, um, in your English novels? Thank you, thank you. And uh, it was great to share again with Tamima and Alayla because we, we spoke years ago on different places and it's great to be united again on the team of this beautiful collection. Um, very humorous as well. Um, I guess my topic is more, I wouldn't say neutral, but um, I, I realized that the writers on this um, list coming from different linguistic background, the cultural background, and I think to a certain degree, we always self-translate beyond the linguistic translation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Tamima translated very well the, the social-political kind of 
backwards and a and kind of deformed society, you know, kind of behind our time. Mm -hmm. And I think Leila translated very well the violence from that land to this land, how you mm -hmm. see the difference um, and, and the sameness um, in different contexts. So, I mean, my case is really, I think, it, it, it came from this language system which is based on the, the ideograms, pictograms. And the direct translation is already quite difficult to translate into alphabet language. So it's a, it's a process of from, from visual language to sound-based mm -hmm. Western alphabet language. And suddenly I think the, the way of thinking, constructing sentences is very different you know, from visualization to sound-based. And I think deeply, really, of course, is cultural translation. Um, it's a process very, very difficult to describe, uh, especially when I'm speaking now, because I'm not a native English speaker, so it's only when I left China mm -hmm. when I was 30 years old. And I realize as I'm speaking now, I'm going through layers of translation. But that is impossible to analyze because it's so fast, the brain how we process information in different cultures and then came out in this sort of slightly British English, but mm -hmm. I think that the English you were speaking yeah. so interestingly, mm -hmm. um, subtle and so different, you know, the background, the reflect your, your, your mm -hmm. university, your education, I think. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah, you said that you had to find your own voice. I mean, were you going to write in British English or American English? And so what was that voice? And it's, it's funny because, um, I lived in China for 30 years and I wrote in Chinese language. I mm -hmm. never thought I would leave or publish in different language. And one day, it's, it's funny, in the situation like this, you know, in a very quite official space like British Library in China, there's a British Council somehow a reception for a, a bunch of educated Beijing youth. Mm -hmm. So I was somehow in it. And then this, this person from British Council said in Chinese, in Mandarin, said, well, you know, we used to kind of looking down people, you know, outside of Commonwealth, or, you know, they spoke kind of dialected English or accent English, but now, we should encourage your dialect, your, your, your English with accent, or, you know, Singaporean English, Hong Kongese English, or Australian English, or Canadian English. Mm -hmm. Basically, he's suggesting <coughs> the dialect, the dialect, mm -hmm. strange word, but the accent to the English is, is the sort of identity you shouldn't mm -hmm. remove. And it's very bizarre, you know, a speech made like that from sort of official mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that for a while, and I thought, my God, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's this colonial language, almost the imperial language, become suddenly strangely yeah. apologetic, but also mm -hmm. inclusive, say, mm -hmm. we are not excluding you, you know. Mm -hmm. Please bring your, your, your language, your, your accent, mm -hmm. your broken grammar, please sabotage this language if mm -hmm. you want, if you're a writer. Right, right. <laughs> so I guess, <laughs> I guess for me it was very funny, you know, from this kind of position, the you know, British Council to yeah. these mainland Chinese, yes. you know, semi-communist <laughs> writers, you yeah. know. Yeah. And I think that was the beginning of mm -hmm. the thinking, I maybe could, you know, use a broken language which I, you know, mm -hmm. had no, grasp, but yeah. launch a kind of experiment mm -hmm. about language. Yeah. You write really you know, well in, in the essay about how difficult it is to translate sometimes, like the Chinese peasant, the example you gave, Chinese peasant looking at the sky and sort of cursing. You can't translate that curse so well, isn't it? It's so hard to do. It doesn't yeah. come out right. So, you know. I think it's, uh, the, the difficulty is the deep cultural heritage, you know, the, the, the tradition, the, the expression from very deep cultural, linguistic kind of inheritance. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's why I think the humor is so difficult mm -hmm. to translate um, idioms, phrase. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and it's amazing, you know, I think fiction manage to grasp that human universally. Mm -hmm. But again, I think you have to work with different languages, you know, especially coming from different kind of cultural background. I think mm -hmm. those writers are very sensitive mm -hmm. to, to how should we transmit mm -hmm. that humor or that tragedy in, in a universal language. Mm -hmm. I think the person who sort of broke that mold actually was Salman Rushdie when he just wrote in the language that he wanted to write and he just took it a step you know, just lifted. A lot of writers used to say that, you know, when once they read Midnight's Children and they read that l the language, it was just as if they were set free. It was like a weight had been lifted from their shoulders. Mm. And they, you know, you adapt that language, which I think you do so well. Because the other thing you say beautifully is that it's not just the language, it's also the space that you are translating. 
uh, and you know you say how do I recreate China you know sort of rainy windswept day uh, on the mm. near King's Canal you know King's uh, King's Cross Station on the canal not far from here and, yeah uh, I I guess it's better I read this section. I think yeah, yeah, that'd be it might be yeah. easier to explain. I, I find it often <laughs> talking about translations between academic theoretical language and the very practical kind of, you know, the skills how to translate. So I often find myself kind of lost, lost words because how to describe mm -hmm. the process of translation under the mystery of languages. Um, so these sections from uh, my book called the Radical. Radical is a word, of course, you know, the, the common meaning we know, but radical in Latin is radis, so it's roots, radis, R-A-D-I-X, roots of a word. And in Chinese, exactly the same, because we began from a busho, which is radical, a, a, a little kind of image or ideogram. And then we build from this little Chinese ideogram and then become one, one character, so we say kanji or hanzi, and that's radical. <laughs> so in a way, it's so common, you know, that underneath the language difference actually is we build on the same thing, it's the roots of a word, even though when I say word is, is pictogram, when you say a word is alphabetical word. So this section is called Language as a Virus, and this concept is taking on the William Borrow. Um, in Borrow's supposed science fiction novel called The Ticket That Exploded, um, Borrow writes, language isn't a virus from outer space. Borrow's give us a dark version of language. Words have plagued our minds and now they control us. But we don't recognize this. To quote Borrow's, the word has not been recognized as a virus because it has achieved a state of stable symbiosis with the host. The language virus has permeated, permeated every aspect of our lives. It is stable yet it mutates. We die, but the virus lives on, spreading far and wide. I find it strange that for borrows, the language virus is from outer space rather than an integral element of human life. The very idea of language infecting us makes no sense. If, as Lacan suggested, we are always and we are already language. But for borrows, there was a paradise in which Adam and Eve lived without language and their minds is pure and direct contact with each other and the world. Then came language in the form of a serpent, and then it infected them. I have a different vision of language. For me, language is everything. It is my means of escape from the story that was already written before my arrival in this world. It is my path to freedom. When, as a child, I first became aware of my surroundings, I found myself living in the fishing village with my illiterate grandparents. My grandfather did not speak much, nor did my grandmother. But then, physical language, his violence towards her, and her daily prayers before a Buddha statue, told me that I should not live in their world, nor speak in their tongue. I left. And later, when I lived with my parents, I discovered my father had another language, painting. The way he expressed his vision of the world through images revealed to me that possibility of a different kind of language. When that takes the form of, love, of art. And he showed me that it is possible to choose how to live one's life. After I left my parents, I wrote books and I made films. I experimented with new languages. I tried to live in the life he showed me was possible. A life based in creation and imagination. To live vividly, is to have languages. 
not only language in their limited linguistic sense, but the language as an artistic tool, language as art, language as a way to live an authentic life. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, so much. How are we for? We, we, we'll open up to audience questions in a bit, but I just want one quick round from all of you. Um, all of you did these essays. I think we have about 15 minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. so I'll open it up in, in a little while. Um, all of you, you know, read the other essays in this. Uh, was there any essay that surprised you? Or, oh, you know, you learned something different from them? Or something one of you want to take forward? <laughs> any? <laughs> Some, some revelation that came from any of the other essays, not your own. I, I mean, I think the whole, I, I think what Deepa and Tem were really tried to do was to create an alternative canon. Mm -hmm. um, so if you read it, all the essays, it's not necessarily about one or two kind of ideas about craft, but it's about uh, enabling writers to recreate the standards by which they are expected to write. And mm -hmm. I think as an idea, that's quite mm -hmm. radical. And I think that writers are already doing that. So the ones that are doing that read this at book and think, okay, well, here is kind of permission or here is like uh, a sense of solidarity or of community. Mm -hmm. And I think for those who are hesitating, and I think um, mm -hmm. the essays that are about genre mm -hmm. or, or about taking something like violence, which we mm -hmm. are expected to write about and sort of turning that around, I think that is, it, it, it just provides a sort of like intellectual framework for what we're all trying to do, mm -hmm. which is to come out of the categories that sure. are used to define us and, and hem us in. So, um, you know, this is to all of you because you've all written about places and history. Um, is for people of color, I mean, is history a burden to us? I mean, do you think it is to carry forward and we have to tell our stories? Leela, <laughs> you've covered, you know, Khartoum, which we've known from films and uh, books and paintings, and you've just given us, you know, the Mahdi rev rev sort of rebellion, and we get it from your book in a different way, from the people. How, you know, was this difficult? No, it was... And you it, felt you had to write it? Yeah. No, I enjoyed the, the research, <laughs> you know, to, first when you... I thought I knew the story, but it turned out that I knew it from a British point of view. Mm -hmm. So then when I started to research and go deeper into it, that's when I, you know, found out the Sudanese point of view. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I looked up, you know, sources written in Arabic that hadn't ever made it into English. And, right. uh, and, and so suddenly the picture changed. And mm -hmm. so I myself realized that I was actually also ha have had the story told to me mm -hmm. from a kind of a Western imper imperialistic um, perspective. Mm -hmm. And then, but going, you know, to, to the research, I could then tell it in a different way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was quite fascinating for me. I was, I was just so fascinated by, by it myself. Right. Yeah. Actually, this reminds me of my own experience, uh, which I'll share with you, because I, I write nonfiction. So when I wrote, uh, when I had the idea of Victoria and Abdul, and I thought, okay, I'm going to write about Queen Victoria, who has the maximum number of biographies written about her, in English, in German, in everything. And there's me, you know. <laughs> unknown Indian, wanting to write something about her life, about a relation with an Indian man, a young man. Um, so it was actually rejected by many big publishers because I don't think they even read it. I don't think they read the outline. One publisher actually sent back a note saying, oh, it's about the mutiny and we have a lot of books on the mutiny. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And so it was a space that was very wide that was owned, that was written by them. Uh, and then, of course, well, you know, and as all of you have done, you just carry on. So I wrote it. It was published by a small publisher. Uh, and then, of course, thanks to the critic, you know, it got so many excellent reviews. And then, you know, then the film office came. And so now they're very proud of um, this part of their heritage. So it actually went a whole circle. Those. Hindustani uh, Urdu journals, which had never been studied before, no biographer had ever opened them, uh, looked at them, um, suddenly are now being sent out by the palace on um, exhibitions to show that, you know, the queen learned. So sometimes it comes full circle, but it is hard because 
uh, even with the wars. I mean, you know, I've written about the First World War, Second World War, again, Indians, biographies. It is so hard because that is another space they own when it comes to the Western world, you know. They won the Second World War. It was all done on their back. Forget empire. We paid no part. Uh, so it's hard. But, you know, I am so delighted that all of you have taken these up and have been writing, you know, all the things that you want to write. And I will shut up now and give it to the audience. So do raise your hands. We have 10 minutes? 15 minutes. Perfect. Right. Yes, please. Lady over there. Thank you. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that I recently read Layla's River Spirit, and uh, it is the most brilliant novel, um, the best I've read for, for many years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. and, <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to pick up uh, Shravana's comments on publishers re rejecting her book to begin with and to ask the other members of the panel to what extent they have found that publishers actually don't allow you to, um, to, to go beyond the bounds or, and place you in, in um, particular sort of market, marketing areas that you would prefer not to be placed in. So that's, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about? <laughs> You, you want me to list all my failures? I'm really, I'm excited. Uh, I just got my 15th rejection from the New Yorker, which I carry, and somebody told me it takes 20 years to get published in the New Yorker, so I'm on like year 18 or something, something like 2025 is definitely going to be my year. No, in all seriousness, I think the only way that publishing is going to change is if the publishers change. And if publishing continues to be run by a certain... Uh, kind of person who can afford to work in publishing. So the, the the pay in publishing is very poor. You have to have contacts, and and there's a certain kind of person who gets to be like that editorial assistant job that is feels so kind of formidable and closed to everyone else. Um, and unless the publishers change, we cannot expect the institution to fundamentally alter. And I have seen changes in the 15 years since I've been published. Um, I don't know about you, Shalu, but um, it, it feels like things are, are changing, but, I, but, but we have to think of it as like, it is an institution that has had a history of many hundreds of years, and the institution has to change before the output changes. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess also another way is to, to hope or to provoke, you know, the, the grassroots, the bottom, <laughs> the change from the bottom as well. I think the, the habit of readings, um, the mainstream kind of, I wouldn't say laziness, but the way we're so wrapped, completely, you know, being jacketed by this mass production. Um, our taste and our reading habits is so under the control influence. You know, say mass media, you know, Netflix or HBO, the, the whole production which really uh, still the, the different way of life and imagination. And I do notice because coming from Chinese, you know, the, the mainland kind of background, we didn't have any of BBC or Netflix or HBO, none of that, because all forbidden. And which means we suffer from another kind of propaganda system, which is pure and immune from the, the Western commercial kind of power. But on the other hand, um, if the whole world is living under just, you know, three large kind of mass media production, then I guess we don't have alternative imagination. You know, so our ch children would be growing up from that. So how could we struggle to somehow against that kind of mass institution? The production is to either we, you know, as as Tamima said, we you know we, we rise, you know, the head on with <laughs> with a big institution, or somehow we write individual writers like we are here, write, you know, politically differently, wonderfully, alternatively, authentically as much as we can to somehow to, to put the work in the, in the place called, you know, the mean word called the market, the commercial word, to say, you know, here's something different. And, and as Deepa, you know, suggested as a list, where one of, you know, those writers, you know, have a look, their voice might be very different, that might be very interesting, even more interesting. So I guess, you know, from, from bottom and from the, the top, you know, this has to, to change. Yeah. <laughs> 
I just want to add very quickly that the book is also asking for readers to read differently, you know, because you're used to reading in a certain way. You're used to reading, say, Hemingway or Shakespeare, and you think that's how stories should be written. And there are ways in which, you know, stories are not told in the same way across the world. And, you know, my wish is that publishers would read this book. So it's called Letters to a Writer of Color, but I really think, you know, people in publishing should be reading this because and taking it seriously, because there's so many diversity initiatives and so much talk which happens, but I think that's not followed up with action, and which, which is why I feel you know, a book like this becomes necessary. Absolutely, yeah, so, yes. <laughs> Uh, Shravani, I just want to say very quickly mm -hmm. that your book, um, Victoria and Abdul, was a hit in Pakistan, <laughs> and uh, where I was proud to publish it. Mm -hmm. And I think somehow uh, people in Pakistan found what we had written in it very compelling. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Victoria had never been to India, mm -hmm. um, and yet, um, you know, you wrote about the area that is now ab about her interest in learning to write in Urdu. And uh, also, I think, um, of course, he lived in Agra, mm -hmm. Abdul, but his uh, descendants were in yeah. Pakistan. And I found actually, his diary They in met Karachi. you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really very widely read and greatly appreciated. Oh, thank because you. Because of the new face that you showed of Victoria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, thanks, thanks, Amina. I think that um, publishers have also changed now. Now they are looking, I think, for actively for you, if you probably suggest something outrageous and, uh, you know. <laughs> they'd probably take it and not question it as they probably did when, I mean, Victoria and Abdul, you know, I wrote this book, it, it was published in 2010, so can you imagine, it's, it's a long time ago. Um, but uh, I think since then the publishing industry has also changed a lot, so hopefully going forward, baby steps. <laughs> um, yes? I would like to ask, uh, I'm, my English is not my mother tongue, but I actually published a novel in, in English two years ago. But in a way, the people in the novel were from my background, and uh, if it was written with a Czech accent in English, it doesn't matter because the, the people there. I was wondering whether you think it's possible to, to write about, uh, with a foreign accent, about... Uh, and I mean writing with a foreign accent, not speaking, mm -hmm. which I have got a strong accent, about people who are not from your culture and how uh, it would be taken, whether, uh, how, where are the difficulties? Because in a way, the, the voice is different. And you were talking about self-translation and I... Okay, I, <laughs> it's a great question. It's difficult to answer, I think. There's a huge discussion amongst the writers, really. You know, we were, we were discussing, you know, can you write from a completely different point of view? For example, if, can I write from a white man's point of view or can I write from African women from, from or whoever, you know, Sudan or, 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 or Mali, you know, point of view, you know, if I had no such background? Um, I think the, the, the early answer is say, no, you have to possess that kind of knowledge or or a kind of physical experience at least. And then that's as if to say, the imagination kind of worth nothing in this kind of evaluation, as if artistic license has no real weight in, in the artwork. So it's a very interesting, I mean, huge topic, because this is also for into the discussion of the identity politics. Can you write about me? Because you don't have my kind of gender and organs. You know, my body do not have the same body structure as yours. And I think this is a huge discussion. Can we imagine differently? Can we write and think from the other's point of view? And I think we can. Absolutely we can. So I was thinking about this quite a lot during all these years when I was writing in second language, which is English. And that bothered me a lot, identity speaking and uh, you know, all other aspects. But I, I do think everyone should try from the other's point of view. That's exactly, I think, art media for, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Was there another one? Yeah, I just wanted yeah. to say yeah. I, I, I agree with you, but I think there also has to be maybe a next step of checking the accuracy. Because sometimes if, if a person is writing about something that they don't know about 100%, they will make a mistake. 
a, a factual mistake, let's say, mm -hmm. and then it passes through the editor, who also doesn't have an idea, the copy editor, and it goes on and on and on, mm -hmm. and, and suddenly it's picked up by the, the, the reader, one of the readers, or the, the, the who is going to say, oh, but that's that's not right. Mm -hmm. So we, we, you know, we need to also have, you know, a buffer for this to stop this from happening. Because what happens with, like, for example, I've for for years I pick up factual mistakes about Muslims f f in all kinds of writing, and then what make it makes me feel that I'm not important as a reader, that this book wasn't written for me, because this mistake has reached so many people mm -hmm. and no one noticed. And this book is successful and this book has you know, been awarded prizes and all that. But it's got this really factual error in it. Uh, and so it just gives this feeling of that, that, that you're not really important enough. And so I think we need somehow to get maybe sensitivity readers or, or you know, the copy editor might, has to be someone really quite knowledgeable about this particular uh, area, mm -hmm. I would just say. Yeah. I think we have time for one last question. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. I was I think this is one of the most fascinating panels one has ever been to. Thank you so much for organizing. Thanks this. to these fabulous Thanks women. To these fabulous women, yes. <laughs> very interesting. I was quite interested in two questions. One is to Anna Anapara, which is about your collaboration with Temur Sumro. How did it work, given that you were working with a man? And <laughs> And the other is to um, actually Shalu. I don't know, uh, I think your work is quite difficult in some ways to understand because it's quite, the ideas are quite complex. You put it over really well. Um, but um, I would love to read it, I think, before I'd ask you a serious question about it. But I love the idea of the translation, self-translation, very much. Mm -hmm. uh, all of you were fascinating. <coughs> Can I ask all of you a question then? Because I also want <laughs> to ask... We have very little time, yep. yeah. Okay. The, the, the question I wanted to ask um, Tamima is about where is your workplace? <laughs> is, is it a real workplace or is it a fictional one? And the question that I wanted to ask Leila is, uh, were you happy with the research that you were able to conduct? Did you have the resources? Yep. So should, you could should, all should I start? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Timur and I were friends for quite a long time before I embarked on this project, and I think that really helped. And we both felt very much sidelined, you know, in in the in the Western academia and publishing worlds. So I think that that was one of the reasons that brought us together. We were we were complaining to each other about what was happening. So you know, you need somebody you can run to about all these microaggressions that you're experiencing either in the classroom or in publishing. And he was that person for me. And, uh, you know, Timur has his own experiences as a queer writer from Pakistan. And I think there was, a, there was a lot that we could talk about. And, you know, I didn't have to explain anything to him. So in, the, in a workshop, just as a very quick example, somebody would say, I couldn't engage with your story because you used the word roti or, you know, something as silly as that. And like, you should be offering a translation for the word roti. And so the only person that can really understand that sense of frustration that I felt was Temo. So it was really actually very easy to work with him and, you know, because we had similar ideas. Yeah, I enjoyed the 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 research. It was it was great fun. I had I I loved doing the the research for my book. I didn't have a, a problem with that. I also thought about I thought a lot about Deepa and Taimur actually because <laughs> about their essays, and I thought it's very interesting that Taimur spoke about having this um, international school education and describing the life of a of a of a kind of a westernized um, uh, you know a person from pakistan and a kind of a privileged life whereas deepa was very much kind of uh, you know she she, she had a uh, a very different, uh, you know, up, up, upbringing, and she was very attached to her family and very deep in the in the in the society. And she was writing about a very uh, poor, um, you know, um, a neighborhood and, and all of that. So I felt that that also was very was showed us the the the, the difference between, you know, we, we we use this term writers of color, but there's a wide difference. Some of us are more westernized than others. Some of us are closer to our cultures than 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 others, and that is gets reflected in in the writing. And I thought. That was a kind of interesting uh, thing, yeah. And there are essays by men, incidentally, in this book too. <laughs> we haven't left them out. <laughs> right, yeah. Your question was, was it real? Um, it was definitely real. I could not have made it up. <laughs>
<laughs> East London. <laughs> and, and I have a follow-up question very quickly. What did your husband think of it? Because you are yourself a startup wife. <laughs> Um, he's always very supportive of my work, so he, he loved it. Right. I think that uh, we have no more time. We are um, we are done with you know listening to these fabulous women. I had so many more questions, but what you can do now is go downstairs, buy the books, all of them, uh, the essay book and their individual books. So they've all written books in you know the last two years, or in fact in April for you, and then Sudan exploded. So my goodness, you know, there's just so much going on. So go down there, buy the books, they will all sign them, and uh, give them a big round of applause. <laughs>